our great panel for taking time out of their day to be here. I feel like each of you are going to bring something unique to this panel, but I'm pretty excited to hear it myself. And thank you to Diane Helbig for moderating. Welcome. And without anything else, let's get started. All right, <laughs> let's. Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. I think the first thing we should do is go around and let people introduce themselves so we have an idea of who's in the room. So thank you all. Um, this is a really important topic, and so we're really going to dive into it. The first thing I would like is if each of you could introduce yourselves and give us a quick bio on who you are and how long and who you're with and how long you've been doing it. So, sure. Andy? I'm Andy Lumbach, and I'm the Chief Marketing Officer over at Spooner Risk Control Services in Westlake. And uh, <laughs> we've got, yeah, there's a lot of great Spooners in the room. I guess. <laughs> Two, anyway. So uh, Ohio's got a unique uh, system for employers when it comes to workers' comp. Employers can't go to property casualty brokers and get a workers' comp quote from them. They can only get it through the state. But what the state does allow companies like Spooner to do is work with great chambers of commerce and trade associations like the North Ridgeville Chamber of Commerce. Marjorie, thank you for your endorsement. Um, and we're able to put groups of employers together and save them money on workers' comp that way. Uh, so I've been doing this for about 14 years now. Uh, it's the only thing I've ever known, and um, it's definitely a unique industry trying to keep injured workers safe and employers uh, not having to pay too much for workers comp and keeping their people safe. Thanks for having me. Excellent. Thanks for being here. Ken. Good evening. My name is Ken Collins. I'm the interim manager of campus security and physical plant services at Lorraine County Community College. I've been at the college about 18 years now. I started out as part-time security officer and I just kind of worked my way up. Also uh, for 17 years I was a part-time policeman for the Sheffield Lake the Sheffield Village Police Department, where I just left uh, but May 14th of this year, decided it was time to get out of it. My wife is having her fifth child, so it's time wow. to be home more. So, but uh, yeah, so I've, I have, and I also teach uh, in the criminal justice program at Lorraine County Community College. I have a little bit different perspective from campus security to police to being in the classroom. So, Excellent. thank you. Thank you. My name is Tom Mitchell. I'm the president and CEO of Bonefish Systems. Uh, we provide software solutions that monitor financial transactions uh, primarily in the public sector. My background is, and we also provide IT services to small businesses. Uh, my background is about 25 years in information technology. The vast majority of that has been in um, large financial services, institutions, uh, big banks and insurance companies primarily, um, and focused on fraud prevention techniques and software that can help manage those processes. Awesome. Thank you. My name is John Metzo. I'm a police officer with the North Ridge Police Department and I've been there about 15 years. Wow. Okay. Thank you. My name is Victor Edwards, uh, owner of Technology Systems Integration and uh, I specialize in low voltage installations including um, security alarm systems, surveillance, access control, and uh, networking. Very good. Okay. Thank you. So, this is so interesting for me because our topic really is about protecting your assets and we have people who are assets, right? And then we have other physical assets, computers, furniture, cars, uh, buildings, all sorts of things. So, um, let's, let's start with what sorts of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the kinds of threats that are out there that you see that are out there that we should be thinking about because I think a lot of times in business we, we think about the obvious but we don't necessarily think about things we should be thinking about when it comes to making sure that we're protected so I'm gonna go this way so Victor would you yes. like to start well like you mentioned obvious everybody thinks of criminals breaking in stealing money stealing possessions that's obviously what um, a security system is for but there's also more security. As a business owner, you are subject to liabilities, and that can be just as devastating as theft. Um, if somebody slips and falls, if an employee injures themselves, lawsuits, uh, worker compensation, a, a lot of those things are, are things that an uh, entrepreneur and a business owner needs to consider and protect themselves with both video surveillance or insurance. Great. Jack, go ahead. 
Um, well, it, I think that, uh, again, the obvious thing is, is things. Um, you, you know, your, your computers, your products, your whatever it may be. But I think uh, a, a big portion that gets overlooked is information uh -huh. that gets stolen. Um, obviously, it, we take incidents of this every day where, where information has been stolen from somebody, whether it be their, their social security number, credit cards, whatever it may be. That, thank you for that. that see, I, I would not have thought of that, right? I, I would have thought, of, OK. So this is good. So, Tom. Uh, I'll add to that. I think that's an important point. And there's a couple of techniques that are starting to really become prevalent when it comes to information stealing. And a lot of them come through, are, are enabled by the kinds of technology that we now have available to us. So there's this term called social engineering, which, which really has a lot to do with how people can find ways, bad people can find ways to manipulate good people into giving them the uh, virtual keys to the information. So it would, it would be similar to someone coming in and saying, can I please have the keys to your vault? Of course, you're going to say no. But instead, if, if they wanted to steal your credit card information or if they wanted to somehow gain access to your computing systems, they can do that through these social engineering techniques, which really involve convincing you that you have some problem that they can help you solve. And as long as you give them this piece of information, they can solve it for you. Um, so we can talk a little bit more about that as we go. But um, this, this social, social engineering technique is one that is really starting to become a big problem for us. It really is. Days. My mother got hit twice by the guy who calls and says, uh, your computer has a, you know, we're from whoever, and your computer has a problem. And she's like, oh, really? You know, and they got money from her twice yeah. on that. So we had to go through a, you're not allowed to talk to anybody you don't know, you know, who doesn't, yeah. like, walk in it, right? Well, in the old days, we used to say, make sure you check the air conditioning repair guy's bad. Right, right. So right. It's Which actually, like in my that, neighborhood, but... we're still, you know, pretty much saying, yeah, it's... It's, it's kind of yeah. like that, but now it's a matter of they're doing it over the telephone, they're doing it through email. Exactly. And they're finding ways to... Yeah. ...trick people. Yeah, thank you. What do you think, Ken? One of the things that I've always seen, even with my work as in the police work or with the college, is really connecting with the first responders within your community, going and talking with them before you have an issue because they may come out to your business and, or, or to your house and take a look around and give you some recommendations, and it's going to be free. And it, I'd rather see that happen prior to something happening versus you, you, have an, you go there for an identity theft situation. And, you know, there is uh, resources that are provided to police departments and even to security departments that are free to individuals and they can be willing to share. So I always recommend to any business to connect with your police department or your fire department, have them walk through and give you a, so it kind of helps, they can help identify threats within your own space. That's great. I've got, I've got two main things and they both center around keeping employees safe. One has to do with um, physical safety from them being hurt by doing the job that you're doing. Uh, and th I mean, don't tell Tom Spooner, the owner of Spooner Incorporated, I said this, but OSHA is just common sense, really. And thank God OSHA is around to make sure that people exercise common sense and don't get hurt. Um, you know, on the other side of it is, this time of year especially, you'd be surprised how many places I can just walk into because it's, it's hot and maybe they don't have air conditioning, especially the manufacturers that we go into. And I walk around unescorted. I mean, you talk about people being able to run wild on IT because IT is not locked down physically. I mean, you could take, I could take things off people's desks if I was an unscrupulous person. I could take information if they had, uh, you know, like banks or whatever. If they had social security numbers, bank account information, you know, whatever, just laying around, I could just take it. So I guess people don't, it's an easy thing to do is just, you know, exercise common sense and, and prevent um, people from having uh, unescorted, you know, access to your facility. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people have to learn by experience, you know, or, um, you know, in our situation, uh, we deal with thousands of workers, comp workers compensation claims every day. Um, and sometimes we're perceived as the bad guy. Yeah. 
So we have all kinds of physical barriers put up to prevent people from being able to just walk around. But there's still some times, you know, again, exercising common sense where someone does get through the locked doors and um, they're, they're supposed to be sitting and waiting for someone to come in, but they're walking around. And the common sense part of it is, hi, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> just don't let someone just walk by. You know, you know Andy, you know Bob, you know Gary, because you work with him every day. Who's this guy walking around? You know, it, it, it still happens in our place. And I know it happens a lot of other places. So it's just, you know, common sense in addition to, um, the statutory things that like OSHA has uh, for maintaining um, a safe workplace. So common sense is not so common. Uh, let's be honest, I, right? If it was, a, a lot of yeah. these things wouldn't happen. I mean, you, you talk about people roaming around and I just heard a story yesterday about a company where that, that they ended up with a virus throughout their entire computer system because the cleaning people one of the cleaning people went on one of the computers that was left open and online and they were reading their email, their own personal email on this company where they were supposed to be cleaning, which is a whole other story. But they went in and they opened up an email that had a virus in it and it infected the company's entire system because it was on their computers. So. Which actually leads me to, and you started this conversation a little bit about prevention, right? Because yes, some people have to learn by experience, but that's why we're having this conversation. If we can, you know, learn to prevent these things, you know, what are the steps that we can take to not have those things happen? Is it that we turn off all the computers before we leave at the end of the day? Sounds like common sense, yeah. but then again. So what are some ideas, and, and you know, whoever wants to go first, what are some ideas that you guys have for us paying attention to things that we could set up to prevent potential hardship on us, potential problems where we compromise our assets. Victor. I think opening up the discussion, having discussions like this inside of organizations, schools, workplaces, mm -hmm. periodically people need to be reminded. And, you know, if it's, if it's not on the top of their head, they're going to forget about it. Um, in my experience, it usually does come down to the human factor. I install equipment, I rely on that equipment, and in most cases, it's not the equipment that fails, it's the user. Yeah. Because you do alarm systems too, right? Yeah, and access right? control. Right. I just completed an installation at a school with 15 doors. Oh. Everybody has key fobs, different permissions for each user. The problem is, if somebody opens the door and lets them in, it, it always comes down to that, and people think, oh, I'm going to be rude if I don't allow this right. individual in. Right. Unfortunately, it's not the world we live in. Unfortunately, it's not. Have you ever seen the Seinfeld episode where Jerry doesn't let the guy in, and it's someone who lives a across the hall from him? He just, like, never really paid attention to it. But that, that's, like, you know, the flip side of that. What are we going to do? We have to think safety first. So who else? What other prevention um, ideas? I, I have a couple thoughts. One is that... Uh, in my experience, large corporations have very uh, thorough and detailed policies and procedures and expectations uh, about what employees can and cannot do. And as you progress down to smaller organizations, those policies get less, more and more lax, I guess, yeah. and less and less formal. And there are things, you know, as even as far as if I'm in a, if, I, if I'm in a large bank, there's no way that your that you could use a computer to check your own personal email. It doesn't work. It's blocked. It can't happen. However, if you go into a small business, oftentimes not only can you check your personal email, you can stream Netflix and you can, you know, do whatever else you want, which which all exposes your network, but it also has negative impacts on productivity. It, 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 uses up your bandwidth for unintended purposes. And just in general, the, um, the notion of having some policies wrapped around uh, what your expectations are of employees is important. And uh, you mentioned it before about having some communica communication. If you're gonna have some policies, I think every small business should have a handful of written IT policies. Amen. I'm not talking about a book, I'm talking about 
you know, just some basic common sense written policies about what people can and cannot do and what their expectations are. Uh, and then you, you have to go a step further than that. Just having them in some book in some closet isn't going to do you a whole lot of good. You need to have a discussion about that every six months, every year, whatever the right, right. frequency is to remind people. Um, but we've, we've talked in, in very large organizations, you have to go through an annual certification process. You have to read the rules and you have to sign off that you read the rules. Uh, and I, I'm a consultant in a number of these large organizations and even as an outside consultant, before you start, you have to read the rules and you have to sign off that you read the rules. Um, small businesses don't necessarily have the time and resources to go to that extent, but you do have to have rules and you do have to make them uh, available to the employees uh, so that they're, they can't say, I didn't know. And I would say there has to be a consequence. Because, I mean, in every business there has to be consequences, and many don't have them, but if it's that important to you that you're protecting your company and your people and all that, then there has to be a consequence, too. If you read this policy, and we talk about this policy, and you sign off that you know about it, and you still don't follow it, something happens because it's that important. Because if you don't have the consequence, then what everyone realizes is you don't really mean it, it's really not that important, and they go right back doing the things that are easy for them, do things they want to do, not necessarily things that are in the best interest of the business. Yep. So. Who else? Other thoughts? I think, I think he brings up a good point when you talk about small businesses versus the corporations, is that from a criminal's perspective, you might target a small business because they don't have that, they're not going to have that huge IT department that has that, those security measures in place. But when you talk about having the binder and having that training and looking through it and bringing it out every you know, three to six months because, uh, you know, I see that in the, in the security world where we have these great plans and we develop them and then they go on a shelf for three years and never, and you, in that time, threats have, have, have evolved, people have moved on, you have hired new employees, and in the cyber crime world, the threats evolve every day. It's, it's changing every, every week, so you got to stay with it and kind of, not that you have to be so focused and paranoid on it, just be aware more than anything, and so, because you're almost probably more susceptible because you're not as, uh, you don't have that firewall, those, that real thick network of a protection, so. I think that's a really important point is that things are changing so quickly and, and we are encountering, you know, as, as technology changes and the world changes and neighborhoods change and uh, business districts change, criminals get creative, right? I mean, you must see this all the time that we'll get really used to a certain kind of crime and then someone else will come up with something. And, so it is about having that sort of vigilance and finding out what's going on, you know, being aware of what are the new current um, challenges that we need to be paying attention to and are we covered for them? Because what you don't know, you're going to find out, not necessarily in a good way. Do you have something, Andy? Yeah, I guess the, one of the most eye-opening things for me and, and my experience at Spooner is at one point in my career, I was responsible for all the standardizing all the best practices of how we manage claims and how we had our policy set up for IT and everything else. And it was because we had to be SAS 70 compliant and then SOC 1 compliant uh, from an auditing standpoint every year to service some of the larger self-insured workers' comp accounts that we had. And SARS being Oxley was the law that came out that made uh, service organizations like Spooner have to go through that. And I guess my point of all this is employers really don't know what it is that they're vulnerable for, vulnerable to from an IT standpoint or from an operations standpoint or from a physical proximity standpoint. And thank God for Spooner that we went through that because it was eye-opening to us yeah. to see all the things that, wow, that, that is, we are vulnerable there. Or, oh, yeah, maybe we shouldn't all have access to um, uh, check stock to write checks. Maybe our system should be set up so you can't do multiple checks and send multiple checks in error. That would be a problem, wouldn't it? You know, maybe we should have our firewall locked down. What you mentioned earlier about that situation with uh, a cleaning person getting access to a terminal. Um, I could tell you that I almost had death threats from the employees at Spooner because I told them after five minutes their terminals were going to lock if they stepped away from their desk. And then they had to remember their password and log in. They couldn't just leave it open 
at all times. He thought I was the boogeyman or something. I was like, well, you know, we have to do this in order to maintain our certification and continue to use these clients. So, you know, uh, there are great resources out there for IT, like uh, boutique IT solutions that will come out and do an assessment because you don't know what you don't know about, right. about that. Uh, there are great uh, security companies, um, and I'm sure you could probably reach out to um, the local police force to take a, a, an assessment real quick walkthrough, just like you would the fire department, to make sure that you're you know, safe from a fire and you're also you know, safe from a physical proximity standpoint. I guess the thing is people have to um, open themselves up, I guess, in some way and make themselves vulnerable in order to understand what it is that they don't know. And, that's a quantum leap for some people. But so part of that too is, I think one of the things you just said that's so important is we don't know what we don't know. So if I don't know, if I have a business, physical location, a couple of employees, there are a lot of potential threats to, to my company and my physical assets from, from the money to the property, to everything in between. So, so it's like having contingency plans, right? So we can think this will never happen to me and God willing, it never happens to me, but I should have a contingency plan. I should have some sort of, it's like, you know, when you buy a house and they tell you, and you have kids, make sure everyone knows how to get out if there's a fire, right? Make sure that you have some sort of a escape route, that kind of thing. So you need to have some sort of contingency plans for what do you do in the event that X is going on, right? That there's... Somebody loose and I'm getting the feeling someone was loose in town. Right? <laughs> so I'd, uh, I'd like to add that yeah. the, I, I face this question almost every day. We do business with about 180 public school districts in the state of Ohio. And a, a lot of our business is focused on the uh, accounts payable and payroll processes and putting software in place to ensure that there isn't fraud in those processes. But the treasurers of those schools say, well, what should we do about our control infrastructure in general? And my answer is two things. One, it takes leadership vigilance. Whoever, in this case, it's a school treasurer. In a small business, it's the president of the business or the, or the branch manager at the bank or the, whoever it might be. Yeah. Whoever's in charge needs to step up and needs to evaluate the risks yeah. that are in place in that organization. I think there's two ways to do it. One is get the team together and brainstorm. Spend 45 minutes or an hour. They know, actually, when you start talking about it, they actually know where you're exposed. They're like, I, right. I, I know if I get up and leave that this cash box that's not locked, yeah, <laughs> is, right. or whatever the situation vulnerable. is, right. they, they know where the holes are, and yeah. if they're given the freedom to speak about them, they will. Uh, the second is, there's plenty of outside organizations that can do a risk assessment and bring with them the experience of having seen controls that are in place in many other organizations and provide input. That's great. Uh, and that usually is a few hour process, so it depends on, how, depend, every organization is a little different, yeah. but it can be as small as a few hour process and, and as a result it's not an exorbitantly expensive endeavor. So I recommend doing both those things. Yeah. Get the input from the team and bring some money from the outside in to just come in and go through and ask questions and give you an assessment of where your exposures might lie. You know a great you know comment to what you just said is depending upon the size of the company and what kind of insurance they carry, a lot of the property casualty brokers and property casualty carriers have a vested interest in making sure that all those things are safe, whether it be IT or physical. And some will actually do a assessment or walk through to check vulnerability for free. Well, it's not really for free, people. I mean, they pay for the, per the worker. They pay for the policy, but I mean, you see where I'm getting But that's at. part of it, right? Yeah, yeah. So why not take advantage of it? Lee? Do you, any of you know, is there any way that a small company or an entrepreneur can get a certification uh, after someone has walked through and given them an evaluation as to their, you know, the, the downside in their uh, uh, operation, that they could then take to their insurance company and possibly get a 
a premium uh, reduction because they've had the certification. I can answer that for sure. Um, when you have an alarm system, you will get a certificate of monitoring uh, from the underwriters listed monitoring center, and you can then take that certificate to your insurance agent. And um, I've seen premiums come down maybe $50. It's not a lot, but for the personal protection you get, I think it's worth it. Additionally, um, if you have a fire alarm system, they will give you an additional discount on your premium for that. For a combination system. The, the rest of the panel, do you know, is there any other certification other than saying the physical equipment? But like, say a walkthrough and evaluation of, of a person that can say these are vulnerabilities that you may have and we suggest you do this. Yeah, in, in my experience, it's not exactly a, that, that's the one example where it's a one for one. But when you're talking to a property and casualty insurance underwriter, they're looking, for, you know, they're, they're going through and they're rating your risk factors. And every insurance company does it a little bit different, but as they go through that process and rate your risk factors, those risk factors all go into the, you know, the, the premium rating that you get and therefore the premiums that you end up paying. Plus I know I'm in IT, so I know in the IT world it's almost the opposite. There's a, a bar that's set and if you don't meet these requirements, you're penalized. Uh -huh. So there's a lot of that, like you've got your PCI compliance and such. It has to be in place or you can't process credit cards. Or if, even if you do, you're penalized month after month after month until you get to a certain level of security um, compliance. So it's almost like they're forcing you uh -huh. to be compliant, which right. is a good thing, right. I think, in some, That's right. you know, some instances. Yeah. Oh, I agree. And if you think about it, one of the things that we're talking about is, you know, pay me now, pay me later, right? You're either going to pay a small amount now, if, it, if anything, to make sure that you know where your risks are and you're getting those covered and taken care of, or you're going to pay later when something goes wrong, when either something bad happens and an employee steals or the cleaning company comes in and, and all of a sudden you're having a problem or your insurance goes up, you know, all of these things end up piling on. You could really, for a small business, it can make the difference between whether you're gonna stay in business or whether you're not from a cost standpoint. So that, that's why talking about prevention, you know, it's, it's okay to talk about what do you do afterwards to, to safeguard things, but I do a podcast and I had someone on who said, um, we were talking about cybersecurity and you know it's enough to keep you up at night, right? When you hear about all this stuff that goes on. And I went out the next day and got an external hard drive and backed up everything on my little laptop, even though I use cloud, right, like Carbonite, so I, I've got that, but you know what? If I unplug that external hard drive, if God forbid ransomware happened and something, someone got in and said, okay, you have to pay us a couple thousand dollars to get your stuff back, I'd be able to say, no I don't, because I have everything over here. Then I just have to remember to back it up every week. You know, that's the other put thing. Put it right? in a fireproof safe. Put Take it in a yeah. right. See. How often do you do it? Do I back it up? Mm -hmm. Okay. The truth. <laughs> I've backed it up once. <laughs> <laughs> the day she bought the drive. Exactly. <laughs> but my computer gives me a little message saying, "Hello, you need to be backing that up." So my plan is. Tomorrow I'm going to do that. So, so, so don't anybody, you know, go, you know, taking over all my stuff. But seriously, because it's so easy to happen. It's, right? It's just sort of crazy. And we can convince ourselves that we don't need certain protections, like, you know, the kind of antivirus software that you really have to pay for. We, we can convince ourselves of all that until we get really hurt. And then what do you do? So I want to put it out to you guys here, other questions that you have for the, anybody on the panel or the entire panel, because I want to make sure you get your questions answered as well. Anybody? Well, before going on to questions, I, I do have a comment. <clears throat> going along with what you were saying, Diane, that, you know, we figured, who wants to come into my business? I mean, my business isn't really that valuable. But there's some wackos out there that they don't want to, they just want to cause you disruption. Mm -hmm. And how many have lost a wallet or whatever and have to go through and replace your, 
your driver's license, your credit card, it's just a pain in the butt. And that's what we, we have to get that message across. And, and I don't know how to get that message across to uh, people in general that it's, it could happen to you. And a lot of things are really easy. Like here, here's a really silly one. Put a password on your cell phone. So, so it times out, right? So if someone takes it, it's not really valuable to them unless they can, and your password can't be password, you know. I know. Or one, two, three, four, right? That's so, bad. Uh, pardon me, is that bad? <laughs> is that bad? <laughs> so that would be bad, right? So like, I just got a new phone and it's my fingertip. So, unless someone's gonna cut my finger off when they take my phone, which hopefully they don't do it. And it's just this one finger, it's not any of the others. So, it, you know, it seems like, oh, seriously, who wants my phone? I don't know, but I know if I didn't have my phone, I, I'd be out of my mind, right? I, I mean, what would I, it, it could almost shut my business down, not having my phone. So, having a password on your computer that other people can't figure out. It doesn't cost you anything, Sounds sort of basic, but so many people don't do it. Because it's inconvenient to have to then either remember the password or... So. I'd kind of like to add to that. Yeah. I think tonight we've kind of talked about how technology can open us up and become vulnerable to hackers and other problems. But on the flip side, too, I see where technology helps <laughs> all the time. I mean, imagine if the building didn't have a fire alarm system. How would you know the building's on fire? Um, simple things like that, in the last 10 years, we've developed so many better things. You know, we have carbon monoxide detectors, fire alarm detectors, glass break, um, you know, burglar alarms. You have medical alert panic buttons. If your grandma falls down the steps, it automatically senses it and goes off. There's all kinds of systems that can also assist us in, in having better security, safety, yeah. and, and ease of access. Um, the internet too, although it has some negatives, it also allows you to view these messages remotely. You can see when your house is broken into, you can see which window, which door. Um, you know, in, in large organizations, if you have an emergency system, the new ones have voice annunciation. So it'll tell you when you're in the hotel room, there is carbon monoxide, get out now. It just doesn't flash wow, and, and really? siren. Um, you know, with terrorism and other things on our minds today, these new systems are more nimble and they're able to address what it is, where the problem is, where to go for safety, where to take shelter. There, there's a lot of benefits to it. Absolutely. And we just want to be making sure that we're taking advantage of the resources that we have. And that's why I think it's important for us to talk about what are those resources. Because we don't know what we don't know, we can think of the obvious ones. What are the ones we might not be thinking about? What's each one of your number one? If you could do one thing, or what's your number one thing? That's that a great you question. <clears throat> lock your doors. All right. no, that's what? Good. Yeah. I locked my doors for years and years and years. Right. I agree. Your car I, I was just going to say cars because we car. constantly crazy when people one. think they're in a safe neighborhood. I don't. I don't have to lock my doors. I don't have to lock my cars and. I'll, I'll tell you what, I, I've got an alarm. Obviously, I've got a cruiser sitting in my driveway every night. I've got Dobermans, and I still lock my doors and my windows every single night and make sure that everything's completely locked up before I go to bed at night. So, um, I mean, it's, it seems like common sense, but See? a lot of people think that, that it's not going to happen to me, just like you had said. I'm going to have to have you repeat that into my phone so I can take it back to my mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up in West by God, Virginia, and they think you don't have to lock your doors. Everybody's free. Yep. <laughs> so, yep. Wow. Mom. Not everybody, right. right? I know my son had his bike stolen seven times. You'd think he'd figure out not to leave it on the front porch, right? But no. Se and my husband found it seven times, actually. Yeah. So okay, I'm sorry. So <laughs> for me, I, it would be uh, for me, it would be making sure that you're computing environment is managed by someone who knows how to manage it. A lot of small businesses have, you know, the, the lady who happens to be the accountant also is the IT person. Um, and sometimes it has to be that way, but you can have somebody help you on a part-time basis and they can do a few things. One, they can ensure that your systems are set up and protected properly. Two, they can educate you on the 
and your employees on the threats from this social engineering uh, risk that we're all faced with. People don't know not to click on the attachment. People don't know not to uh, answer the call that says they're the, you know, the, the manager from the other, right. you know, the yeah. other office and they need your account number right. for, they don't realize that they can't give that out. So um, don't count on, you know, my biggest thing is probably don't count on the part-time mm -hmm. on the side IT person to make sure that all of your systems are going to be okay. Mine would be uh, just to be aware of your surroundings, wherever your business is, just being aware and, you know, understand what are the threats to your business. I mean, I work at a community college. Everyone immediately thinks of something along the lines of an active shooter or armed threat. Obviously, a tie in our mind, but also the weather. I mean, wh where we are in Illyria, we get some pretty severe weather, and if we have a full day of classes and a pretty good storm comes through, where, you know, we start getting tornado warnings, things like that, then, you know, or... You know, other other odd things that aren't man-made that are causes of it, it could be issues. So I always tell people just to be aware. And also, when you're leaving or coming into your, your business, if you have a, a, a physical location, be aware of your surroundings. Who belongs there? What cars belong there? It's your parking lot, or do you share with other businesses? Are there cars that don't belong? You kind of, like your neighborhood, you know what cars, uh, over time, you're going to kind of see patterns of people, who walks. It's kind of be... You know, I know we get so focused with our cell phones or with what, what just happened for the work day or where you got to go yeah. as you're leaving to go home or to wherever you're going beyond. It's focus on what's going on right there because you could be trying to send a text and walk right in, or into something which even in police work has happened to you know, officers in other, other states where they've walked into armed robberies at gas stations because they're not paying attention as they walk in. So, I mean, it's kind of just being aware of technology is great, but also can be a little bit of a distraction sometimes. And I would think to, to add on to that, get to know your neighbors and let them get to know you because then you can watch out for each other. You know, it's like at your house, you get to know your neighbors so that you can keep an eye on each other. It's the same thing with mm -hmm. your business. These guys stole every good idea that, that, I want, that I wanted to say. So I had to come up with something on the fly. Great. And it may not be good. It may not. <laughs> it may not be up. good. Um, two things. One. People need to slow down. I know it's, it's easier said than done, but people just need to slow down. It's, they need to slow down you know, at work um, so it prevents accidents from happening and mistakes from happening that also cost money. Um, I also, also think that people um, need to slow down and think about what, if I leave right now, what's on my desk? If I leave right now, is my computer locked? Is, my office locked. Is everything in this place safe? Just, so just, I guess the one thing is, again, it plays into common sense, but slow down. What can you see through the window? Yeah. I guess the, the other thing, too, is um, people, it's great that we have all this technology. I love it. I love all the technology we have, and that speeds everything up, and this plays into slowing down. But be aware of how to handle things if technology doesn't work because <laughs> technology sometimes Wait, technology sometimes out. fails so you know uh i mean even i've got a security system at my house i've got the i've got the fire alarm and everything and and uh, i've become so reliant on the keypad that i have my door it's so cool but I always make sure that i have my key with me because what if the battery dies you know or what if, what if some of the technology fails or whatever? So always be aware yeah. of how to handle something yeah. if and when technology fails. How am I going to get into my house? That's a good point. <laughs> you I know? know I would have thought of that. <laughs> uh, and then Marjorie. Okay. Uh, Ken, I, I sat through a presentation that you gave uh, to the college uh, uh, in general as to if there's an active shooter on campus. But can you share with us in 60 seconds or less what are the rules to follow? Because we may not have that active shooter on campus, but it could happen in a anywhere. shopping center, it right. could be anywhere. And, and I think that's valuable just to, to know that. So if you could give us that. Yeah, what we, what we kind of model our response for our students and our staff and our, uh, our faculty is what's called run, hide, fight. It came out of the city of Houston. It was based on a business uh, idea that essentially running or evacuating the area is your first option. 
and then hiding, and when I say hiding, I mean just turn the lights off and hope that they pass you by. You really, you know, do turn the lights off, also barricade the door, make it hard for that person to enter into that space. We saw that at Virginia Tech. We've seen it at other uh, areas that where people have been saved because they were able to either evacuate or use tables, chairs, the things that in the room to, to barricade and buy yourself time so these guys can get there and, and intervene and, and, and stop the threat. So I think and then the, option, the last option, which is always the most uh, concerning and always scary to think about, is the fight and the fight back. And you know, we as humans, we don't really want to engage with each other, but when that does happen and yeah. there's a threat in front of you, you have to you know, use whatever you can, your purse, uh, your, your laptop, pens, pencils, things to throw back to throw at the person as a group to converge on the person if there's more than just one of you in the, in the room. And we've seen cases where that uh, in Phoenix with uh, the, when the congresswoman got shot uh, at the book signing, it wasn't you know someone 25 years old or, or that jumped on it. It was a 62-year-old grandma that essentially came out from behind cover and tackled him first, and five other people jumped on him. So it's not going to be the big you know strong person. It may just you may be your opportunity to go. So with Run, Hide, Fight, there's a couple of videos online. One is the, for businesses, you can look for the city of Houston's. Uh, for the colleges, what we show is Ohio State made one that uh, is for higher ed, but all the same concepts. Your first option is to evacuate. Second option is a lockdown or try and barricade you or whoever it is within an area. And the last option is to fight back. And hmm. I don't know if you want to give, uh, you probably uh, deal with it with two. Yeah. Well, I, 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 just to expand on a little bit, Obviously, you want to make yourself a hard target, not a soft target. Um, we did a scenario at the Amherst City Schools for a, a active shooter situation. And the, the teachers in the district acted as students for the day. And then we went in in a scenario that, you know, there was somebody that went in this. And what they were told to do was, was do what they were instructed to do and instructed their own students. Yeah. And uh, they would pile chairs, desks, anything they could pile in front of the doors and just to make it harder for that person to come in the door. And I know that even after we, we cleared out the threat, we have to go in each room and clear every single room out to bring people out one at a time, hands on your heads. You never know who else is in the building. Um, but I can remember going into several rooms and not even being able to get from the hallway into the room because they had things stacked so well that there's, there's no possible way that, that you can get in there. Wow. And I mean, it, again, like, like you said, you want to you make yourself the hardest target possible. It's a tricky. I mean, that, that's a so in a room like this, we would just pile everything up. And oh yeah, the tables, tables, chairs, locker. I mean, anything that you can physically pick up and put there. We'd, we'd have a lot we'd have to do there. Marjorie, did you have something? I have a question. Is there a course that is offered by your college that would address safety in businesses that we could mm -hmm. offer our chamber members in general? I don't believe that there is a course, but one thing, obviously this is being taped, this is something that we would be very pleased to send it to you for you to send it out to all of your members just to make them at least aware, at least that's the first step. Uh, but I'm not aware, Ken, you may be aware. No, and one of the things we've always recommended when, when people ask us that question, is we recommend you t talk with your local law enforcement. If you don't know, know anybody there, let us know or let me know. I have, in 17 years, I made a lot of contacts within multiple departments, and I have no problem. It would be great to be able to offer yeah. Yeah, I think even sort of educational I just want to say that this is nothing new. 30 years ago, I was on the 12th floor of the Higby Company in the employment office, and I had shut the door, and all of a sudden, the shot goes off. I, the, the guy was after his girlfriend in the other office. And then I, the door was closed. I locked it under the desk and on the phone to our yeah. security department. I mean, they were there in seconds. but. Yeah. Um, it's nothing new. It, it happens. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I'm, I'm going to give you my, can I write on this thing? Mm -hmm. It's not a smart board or anything, right? <laughs> Always worries me. Forever. It's like the microchip in the back of my head. Okay, so this is a password trick. 
that an ex FBI guy gave me on my that is so great because what it does is you'll never forget your passwords and no one will be able to hack your passwords. Okay, so this guaranteed. He said, yeah, and there's some website you can go to where you can put your password in and it'll tell you how strong it is. And every time I do this, any site I do it on, they, they, it always goes to strong. You know, it's always like, okay. So someone give me a, like a four or five word sentence. I love Milky Ways. Great. I love Milky Way. Milky Ways, one word or two? Whatever you like. I'd like it to be one. You'd like it to be one? I'd like it to be one word. All right. I love Milky Ways. To eat. <laughs> <You said. laughs> How about I love to eat Milky Ways? Because that's really better English than what you just did. Okay, so. <laughs> it's okay, I know her. I'm allowed to talk to her like that. Okay, so it was five words, right? I love to eat Milky Ways. So you do hashtag five because it was five words. Oh, I, right. well, okay. So the first letter of each word is capitalized. Then, so there's I is only one word, okay? I mean one letter. So L, lowercase O, capital T, lowercase O, capital E, lowercase A, capital M, lowercase I, and then, Whatever site you're doing it on, like let's say we're on Facebook, capital F, lowercase a. So you always know what your sentence is because it's always the same sentence. So it's always, I love to eat Milky Ways, okay? So it's always hashtag five. It's always capital I, capital L, lowercase. This whole part is always the same and then you just add in the first two letters of whatever site you're doing the password for. Get it? Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, I use this now all the time. I'm not going to tell you what my sentence is because then you'll be able to figure out my password. But it's so easy. It's the easy. So anyway, there you go. Okay. Other questions? We have time for, say, one more question. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Really? Try it. Yeah. 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 And if I could figure out what episode of the podcast it was, I would tell you, and then you could listen to it because was, it was really... I'll try and find out and I'll let you know. And you can let everybody know. As long as you tell all your friends, you'll be fine. <laughs> <laughs> Write it down, put it in your wallet. <laughs> Do not tell anybody what it is. I, I don't know, Lee. I, I don't know what to tell you. But it's better than carrying around a whole bunch of passwords, right? Well, you don't stick it on a post-it note. Put it <laughs> Thank <out>. you. <laughs> it's sort of the whole point that it's so easy that you don't have to. So do a short, like we, if we had done I Love Milky Way, how easy would that have been? Three words, right? Just I just wanted to add something about that, too. Yeah. I've seen people where they take a Word document and they put all of their passwords, all of their bank account numbers, everything in that Word document. There are viruses and Trojan horses that will go into your computer and basically upload all of your documents. Mm -hmm. And then they got it. And somebody in Russia is going to hack into your bank and steal your money. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you really have a problem remembering what your passwords are, they make these cool little password books write it in there and put it in a safe and lock it up. That way, you know, physically it's secure and technology-wise it's secure. Of course, you have to remember the combination to the <laughs> Fingerprints. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Let her worry about it. Here you go. Now someone else has the problem. Right. Any other questions? All right. Well, I, I got to thank you guys. This was really great. Do you have any last words of wisdom for all of us, or you just want to say thanks for having me? No? I thought that was great. It was really, it was great information. Of course, we all have to take it and use it, and that's part of the, you know, the human element is, like, you know, when I was talking about my external hard drive, I'm the one who has to back it up, right? So, but we have to. Are you going to try to back it up this year? <laughs> Didn't I just say tomorrow? <laughs> Good point. Does someone want to remind me? Tina, you want to like, send me a message, right? We can automate yeah, that no, for you. Your, Thank you. Your we yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> this isn't my sentence. Okay. Well, thank you. Exactly. <laughs>
it's not in the video. That is exactly <laughs> right. You will have to change your sentence. That's part of the problem with it. Right. Coming up with a really good sentence. All right, well, thank you guys very much.